hello, hello, everybody. It's uh, 11 o'clock. It's 11 o'clock and we should be starting. Yes. Where are all the people who want to participate in our workshop, engaging local actors, turning MSP bottom up? Are you blind? They're right here. Oh, I'm Where are all the people? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, my God. I was just discussing so much with you. I didn't realize. Yes, but I am very funny. So you're forgiven. <laughs> oh, thank you very okay, much. Okay, should we close the doors or something and get yes. this show no. on the road? Can you hear me? There, we have actually 80 registered participants, so I'm sort of wondering whether we should ring a bell. Uh, so, uh, are, I can think you hear me? There's something with my... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're starting. They can take... Can everybody hear me? Yeah, it's on here. It, it's on here. It's not close Over enough. It move. Ah! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, Sorry. I'll, I'll do that. Give it you do me. that? Yes, I give it. Okay, so anyway, today we are here. I am Susanne Gustafsson. I come from Sweden and uh, I have worked with MSP for, well, the last five and a half years. And um, uh, right now I have my own company, but I am here today to help Andrea moderate this session. And you can. Tell who you are, Andrea. Yes, and Susanna and I, uh, we know each other from earlier, not least from uh, this uh, eminent project that we are, have been working in, Pan Baltic Scope. She has been part of the Finland, Ola and Sweden case and is therefore also very knowledgeable about what we are going to tell. And my own background is in uh, also marine spatial planning, but I'm coming from the re research side and working at the science policy interface, trying to help uh, planners get to know what the academia knows and trying to get the academicians to know what the planners would like to have. Yeah. And Nordregio is uh, participating as a research institute trying to actually do this bridging across. And what we are doing here I think is also very much bridging and uh, we are going to bridge quite a lot from uh, top to down to bottom up and yeah. so on. So I think it's time to switch slide, isn't it? Yeah, you can see our agenda here, and uh, yeah, the aims is to... We want uh, to discuss uh, experiences from our own, uh, not the least from two eminent presenters from the Baltic Sea and one from the South Americas, and uh, want to discuss how and why stakeholders can be included in coastal and marine spatial planning, the why is important, and needs and ways forward to make it work and also to work with capacity development. And we are going, because this is about participation, we're also going to use quite a few methods in parallel. Yeah. And you're now just uh, being distributed a lot of uh, colored cards. We're going to use that. And now you are actually going to be activated by screen I.O. Yes. So The uh, cards you're being given, you will be using, so keep them close at hand. The different colors are important. If you don't have cards yet, raise your hands and... Uh, our friends with the cards will give you cards, but it seems everybody have cards. All right, so screen I.O. Um, now for the workshops, the, the address is a little bit different. You add the W and two for this workshop number two. And we start by a word cloud. We will be looking at this later. Um, and uh, the question we ask in one word or one expression, uh, Ecosystem-based approach is an expression with many words, but works as a word cloud. Answer the question, what is needed to efficiently and successfully turn MSP more bottoms up? And we will be talking about bottoms up during the day. <clears throat> so please, this work, word cloud will run through the entire workshop and we'll get back to it in the end. Yes, and about involving stakeholders. And very important thing here is something, a question that is very simple, but it is very often not asked or not asked properly. Uh, because if you know why participation, then it's also most, more, most, most, much more easy to actually know who to involve, when and how. But if you don't know why, then you can just involve everybody. Everybody, everybody here outside, uh, and yeah, but what should they do, and why should they do it, and what do we want to achieve with that? And if they have too much expectations, uh, then you cannot deal with them. So uh, you need to think a bit systematically also about another thing, and that's 
what is this, how is this connected with our legal system? We have like information, consultation, decision making, and uh, in terms of participation, it's also about interaction. So this stairway we have uh, developed in one of our earlier projects and uh, is going to be included in the publication next year. But it's building on, on a lot of thinking about how to think about marine spatial planning that is actually a top-down thing because it's a mandated thing that authorities do. But how can we turn this bottom up, go this way? Yeah, that's probably one way of doing it. But maybe we actually have to turn it around all the way and let the bottom come to the top. And in that sense, the interaction has to go always uh, different ways and up, down, and also together. And this is also what we are going to try in this session. So bottom up, top down, and center out. And now we are going to talk about the Gulf of Bosnia. So I'm um, just, yes. Now we need to switch. Susan, can you help yes, me with that? Welcome. I'm. Welcome, Stefan Hutter. Oh, Welcome, Stefan, and uh, you will get the presentation soon up and please present yourself you can stand here okay. so Stefan has been leader of the Finland Orland Sweden case in the Pan Baltic Go project go ahead please thank you can you guys always all hear me great uh, so as mentioned my name is Stefan Musa and I come from, or represent the government of Åland, which is an autonomous region in the Baltic Sea region area. And it's a small speck of islands or group of islands between Finland and Sweden. And the Gulf of Botnia is in the northern part of the Baltic Sea region. However, what we have been doing in the FIAX activity and who we are, first of all, as you've heard yesterday, this is a Pan-Baltic Scope final conference. And the FIAX activity is one of the activities inside this project. And this is our final project representation and presentation of our product that we've been doing at pro process. So the FIAX activity is based on like, how do we engage maritime spatial planning, which is in three different processes, three different phases, in one of the sea areas that is residing in the northern parts. And we have three, four different partners that are working or have been working together very actively. We have this. Government of Åland, which is Åland's landskapsgjering, trying to lead this activity with the help of Satakunta region, or the Regional Council of Satakunta, the Swedish Agency of Marine and Water Management, and Nordregia. Some of us are working actively with maritime spatial planning, some of us are, us are researching maritime spatial planning, so together we can find a proper approach. So, hopefully all of you know where you are right now. You're in the European Union, or even in Europe altogether. And these are the countries that are partners in the Pan-Baltic Scope region. However, our activity focuses on the northern parts in the collaborative process between Sweden, the blue one, Finland, the green, and then the orange little speck in between, which is trying to find solutions for this whole area. So it's a pretty large scope, and we have different aims, we have different visions. And just to present what we're doing right now is that we have three planning processes, three planning phases, and this means that we are increasingly having challenges that we need to work together, find solutions together, find possibilities of planning together even in some cases, or which sectors even can work together. So if I quickly present what are the differences in the maritime spatial planning processes in Finland, the no most top one, and all in Sweden. Well, Finnish legislation has a national land use plan that is binding and covers also the territorial sea areas. The MSP covers also the territorial sea as, as well as the exclusive economic zone and there's an overlap of course with the territorial sea areas. However, the MSP for Finland is not binding, it's a strategic plan, but it can for example give advice to the national land use plans which is based on regional plans and municipal level plans. This Olandish case, we don't have an exclusive economic zone but we only have an MSP that covers the sea area. The land use planning does not cover the sea area at all. Even if we have 16 municipalities all together in this small group of islands, they are not always happy that they don't let, are allowed to plan the sea area. But we are trying to collaborate actively from the government perspective with the municipalities to see what are their needs. 
The MSP is not e either legally binding in the Orland Islands, but it is strategical and giving directions of what can be used in the future. Sweden, they have a bit of a different case. Their MSP covers the t exclusive or everything outside of the territorial sea plus one nautical mile from the baseline. So there is an overlap with the municipal level planning or the local level planning, which is an 11 nautical mile overlap. And this has also been causing some kind of issues with Sweden's systems of planning. And their process, for example, is being done this year, hopefully. And they're presenting their MSP in, for their government in late of 2019, whereas Finland and Åland have a different time planning phase. And we're trying to, or Åland is trying to have their MSP implemented early 2021, whereas Finland is trying to have their last phase in 2020. So these issues are one of some causes on how to collaborate and how to find solutions where we're all in different places, we're all different phases, and we have different problems. Just to quickly show on the map where Sweden's three different plans are, the yellow, the orange, the red, they don't cover the coastal area, whereas Finland, the blue colored maps, are cover the coastal areas and the economic zones. At Åland, the green colored here in between, we have 88% of our territory is sea area, so the MSB has a great impact or can have a great impact in the future. So how did we work together or how should we work together? Well, we needed to identify the differences and similarities. Where could we work together and where could we not? Because we have different legislations, so it means that we can't always find solutions that are beneficial for both or identify solutions that are implemented for both. And we also wanted to know which sectors, for example, overlap. Not all sectors are overlapping in the sea area. Not all sectors use the sea area. Maybe they only use the coastal areas. And where do we need to collaborate when we're identifying, for example, fishery grounds because they don't see the borders that we set in the sea area. So who uses the sea actually? And this led into our case studies that we needed to two subcases, one that approached the whole Gulf of Botnia, one that identified problems or solutions even in the whole Gulf. And we arranged these public meetings where we invited stakeholders and planners to meet each other, to talk to each other, and even start building a network where they can identify solutions or even problems together. Well, we always find problems of tackling them or to the challenges that we need to identify. Then we also need to talk with the local level stakeholders, and this is when we dug really local. We went to stakeholders that are actively using the sea areas in the coastal regions of the Åland Islands and the regional council of Satakonda, or the regional area of Satakonda. So we kind of wanted to build a network that would cross all levels, national, regional, and local, because we're all using the sea area in different ways, but we're all dependent on each other. So who should we actually involve when and why and how? Because all of them are somehow involved in the sea, but MSP is pretty new, and they've been using the sea area for generations. We wanted to identify, as I mentioned, the national, regional, le local level stakeholders in the whole Gulf of Bosnia, which of them are cross-border, which of them are even cross-level. So this means that national level stakeholders can also be regional, sometimes even local. So it doesn't mean that once we categorize them into one level, they don't affect the other levels, or they don't even, they can also work in the local levels. So the same goes with local, local level stakeholders. They can have groups of organizations that work in the regional levels. They can identify also national level conflicts and finding the solutions or communication patterns between these levels is one of the crucial points that we should work with. With the stakeholder, level, stakeholder collision or the stakeholder local approach that we did in Orland and Satakonda, we wanted to include them, but we didn't really know how in the beginning. So we focused on fish level stakeholders because they've been using the sea for their users, uses multiple generations. And we wanted to also know if they trusted us. Did they trust us to allow them or allow us to plan for them? Did they trust us to give information that they have and we can use for our MSP processes. So this means that there is an institutional social trust also issue that we need to identify and somehow solve. If, for example, let's say a fisherman does not trust the authority to have a rightful plan or a process that benefits them and us. To identify the local or the stakeholders in the regional level and what are the sea users right now in the Gulf of Botnia, we wanted to ask them 
what are the TUs that you remember? So our first public meeting, we showed them empty maps. This is one of the representatives, but we had death relief maps without cities, without any kind of markings on the map. We wanted the people that attended our meeting to tell us what do they remember from the Gulf, but yeah, what are the areas that are being used for which sector? And what are the visions and possibilities for the future uses? So, for example, offshore wind farms, they identify that these areas could be potential offshore wind farms. Some of them are already, for example, in Plan Botnia identified, and this offshore sector representative identified them and drew them a map. But the other representative also in our meetings identified different users, and suddenly we started realizing that the sea use areas are, in fact, quite many. And as an MSP planner, we're not working with an empty plan or an empty sea area. We're actually working with a lot of users that are constantly using the sea area. So we need to identify who is using the sea and what to do with them and how do we involve them to collaborate. We, from these maps, you can see that, for example, fisheries are one of the ones that go throughout the Gulf, whereas other actors are quite ma mainly based on the coastal areas. And we wanted to also see, because there's a lot of conflict going on between fishers and offshore wind farms, that they don't really collaborate, they don't communicate with each other, and do they really, can they find solutions together? Can they find, identify areas where they don't collide and find s problems that possibly MSP could even help solving? And for the subcase too, where we wanted to talk with the local level stakeholders, we sent out, for example, questionnaires asking if they trust us in different manners, but we also sent web-based map questionnaires where people, the public, could show us important or meaningful areas and even conflicting areas. Putting under the top of layers on top of each other after we had 840 respondents from Satakunta, 450 respondents from Orland, we could start seeing these hotspot areas where, for example, in this picture, the recreational activities happen. What are the recreational activities are also in the respondents because every respondent can actively or even write down in a comment field after they drew, for example, a square on the map, what this recreational activity is in fact is and what are they using and why is it important for them or meaningful for them. We had, for example, also meaningful areas for emotionally important areas. We had conflicting areas and they could tell us what are the conflicts there. Not only can we identify current conflicts, but we can also identify future conflicts if we plan, for example, offshore wind farm areas close to the culturally important areas or the recreationally important areas or meaningful areas. Because in the end, if we plan offshore there, it will collide. It will affect the recreational importance. So we will constantly use these maps to improve our MSPs as well, to include the local needs and local uh, uses. But who should we include? So in our public meeting too, for example, we asked our attendees, what, are the, what is the best way or the most important way to, for the MSP in the Gulf of Botnia? What are the most important things? And e easily you could identify cooperation and collaboration are some of the keywords that are raised constantly. However, this is the question, how do we collaborate and co cooperate when there are differences? What is also the best way to improve an MSP, whereas what we also, what kind of effort does it require, but and how important is it? And from this, we can identify, okay, stakeholder involvement is definitely the one that is most important for all of us. However, it also requires most effort, it requires most time. And this is something that is a challenge, especially when the director requires us to have MSP for 2021. So it's a constant process. And who should we in fact include? So we ask the attendees again, Tell us, what are the stakeholders, what are the sectors, what are the people that we should contact in national, regional, and local level? So we made these lists of contact points or contact authorities that we could use, and asking them again with giving us more contacts will increase this list, so it will become a very strong and very long list in the end. And no, we did not always manage to include these sectors in our meetings not in the regional or in the local, because they are multiple. Just looking at our map of who we included and who we managed to include in our public meeting too, 
was that, okay, the green dots represent the ones that attended our meetings in our second public meeting, and the red ones are the ones that we should include according to our attendees. So there's a lot of work to be done. But we tried to include even more in the third meeting, and we even included Shetland Islands, Poland, Netherlands, and uh, people from Estonia, but however, they are not visible in this map because they attended from distance on Skype meetings. So these are the people that attended our meetings personally. Even Eastern Finland that does not have a sea boundary attended our meetings because they have experience and are professors in collaborative governance and how we should include these in the future. So easy to say, this work needs to be continued. We need to include more. We need to find the key people of who have the contact network that we need for the MSP. And all of this information is also presented in our story map, which is our final product for the FIAX activity. There is more information, more maps, more graphs that are available here. And these are just a few of the presentable, presentable cases that we have. So there's text, there are links, there's interactive maps in some cases, and an explanatory process from the first step to the last step, what we're doing right now. And of course, the heat maps are also available in this story map, but sadly not for downloading right now because they're not published in a study. But one of our major also questions is that what were the challenges and enablers that we faced during our FIAXA case activity? Well, let's start with enablers. We had some of the interesting cross border collaboration that we needed to understand each other. We needed to communicate, ask questions. There are no dumb questions, what is said. So we met during meetings. We had very many unofficial and official meetings. S Skype meetings were very adequate as this as well. We approximately had two or three meetings every month in the worst case, where we asked each other questions. What's going on with your MSP process? What are you doing right now? And what are the other processes and needs that you already have identified? Where does it overlap to our sea area? Are your fishers actively fishing in our sea? Or vice versa? Have you planned an offshore wind farm that is possibly going to affect our sea areas or not? So it's a bit like a consultation process, but more inefficient. And making this collaboration network with planners <coughs> has also been very beneficial because you start knowing the persons more personally and you can ask them more personal questions as well. But learning from others, well, we all make mistakes and we all have challenges. But learning from each other means that also we can maybe have possibly avoid some of the mistakes that have been raised in different MSPs. We need to consider each other's plans and other processes as well, such as the MSFD and the WFD have different approaches and different processes. So how do we collaborate when there are other policies that are affecting us as well? so forth and so forth, but some of the enablers are also con online connections. For example, we had Estonia attending our meetings in the public meeting three because they could not attend personally, but they could present how they have been present or using local level stakeholders and stakeholder involvement processes in their MSP process as well. So we learned from their experiences again. We learned how they've been doing, what were their challenges and what we should avoid if we're talking about planning the sea areas with different methods. So challenges, well, as I mentioned earlier in the previous uh, earlier in the presentation, different phases, different timeframes, different processes does definitely cause a challenge that we need to somehow tackle. It, for example, if someone's working with a planning mandate that is binding, whereas the border is working with a guiding plan, there are going to be very big differences in MSB. If we're all working with guiding plans and strategic plans, they can look different, but they still have the same approaches or possibly same approaches. And in the end, is it actually the first person or the first country that makes the MSB, the first MSB that sets the rule for the other MSBs as well? For example, now that Sweden has their, M have their MSB done, will it set the rules for their bordering countries that don't have an MSB yet? Will they have to adapt to their MSP or can Sweden adapt to the new MSP somehow? Well, time of is, is of the essence as well. With a short project, such as the Pan-Baltic Scope project, which is a two-year EU project, we had a limit for a lot of things. For example, we only could have 
three public meetings because they require a lot of facilitation, a lot of effort. And local meet level meetings also require a lot of time outside of working hours. Meeting a local fisherman that's been working from eight to, let's say, six, you have to go to their territory, their region, and meet them in their co coffee house or in their cafeteria to talk with them. So engaging local level stakeholders is it's an effort that needs to be put front as well. But the importance of it and the data that you can collect from them is also very beneficial for the MSB process. And it is difficult to explain to the users that have been in the sea area a long time before the MSB has been, that why should they be included in the new process? What do they benefit from it? When they've already been using the sea, they have their networks, they're happy with what's going on right now, why is there something new that is going to affect them? What do they benefit from coming to a meeting in, for example, the eastern or western Finland, where they're fishing in Holland? The same goes with offshore wind farms, or, or offshore wind farm is pretty new, but cultural heritage, well, cultural heritage is something that historically is very meaningful for us all, but they've been there, so how do we include them? And how do we explain to them that it is very beneficial for them as well as us if they attend our meetings. But this is something that we need to work with in the future as well. We need to tackle these challenges and turn them into enablers. That's, as I mentioned earlier, please, please consult our story map for more information, more data. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. I was, um yeah, it's been a pleasure to work with you doing these things. So it's very interesting now to see the presentation. Um, so, uh, is there a question? You leave now, but uh, <laughs> is there a question from the audience? I have Andrea out there with a microphone. If any one of you would like to ask Stefan a question about what she just told us about. Is there a question? You can also ask a question via, via screen IO. Um, the address, uh, the usual address with the added W2. There's a question. Brilliant. First can first can you just elaborate a bit on how you identified the local stakeholders? Well, we, for example, sent what out. Method you yeah, yeah. Uh, we have lists of registered fishers, for example, fishermen that have actively an income. Maybe 15% of their income is from fishing. So we have lists of these people, but we sent out. We had Facebook presentation or Facebook invitations. We invited them through newspapers. We even sent personal letters to them to talk with us and come to, or can we come to them and meet them up with them? But we also asked them when we're meeting up with them, how, who do you think should be included into the MSP process? So who do you think is working in this area? And after a while, they started telling us, please can I arrange a meeting here because we haven't really been presented the MSP process yet. So rumors is one of the great ways of including people and getting more information out there. Yes, and right now, I believe that we are launching another question on um, the screen I.O. Uh, because uh, Stefan was allowed, <laughs> very kindly, he added his, um, his key enablers and challenges. Yeah to creating this bottoms up MSP. And we would like you to please add yours. Were there anyone missing? Which one would you add? Also, our ne next speaker will also add some challenges and, and, and um, enablers. Should I maybe continue or do you want to? In that case, it's time for me to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> invite Michelle to the stage. Yeah. Welcome, and we try to switch presentations as quickly as possible. Yeah, you do that. <laughs> oh, you can help us. Oh, even better, because I'm a Mac user and I'm always a bit awkward with the next. It's the next one. If you go, not this one. Uh, you go. You, pre you present yourself. Uh, and we are very happy that we could uh, have like this global uh, Baltic Sea Link. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. 
Thank you very much, Andrea. So uh, I'm Shelly Quesada. I'm a consultant of IOC UNESCO for the MSP Global Initiative. And I'm here to present when top down meets bottom up. Because as you know, IOC UNESCO is an intergovernmental organization. And we have a case study in the Gulf of Guayaquil between Ecuador and Peru. And uh, we want to present how we are engaging the local actors in this area towards a cross-border marine governance. Okay, so why bottom-up? When we are talking about MSP, we always talk about stakeholder participation. And we are always calling about more bottom-up approach. And uh, I was reading two weeks ago this article uh, about climate change, and there are a couple of sentences that I think it explains why we are all the time calling for more bottom-up approach. And I would like to, to read these sentences to you. So, as adaptation decision-making becomes more geographically distant and more top-down, it's likely to become less effective. So, we are talking about climate change, that is a transboundary issue. But while mitigation of climate change is best tackled globally, adaptation is better tackled locally, given the great diversity of situations. Residents who understand their local context best are best positioned to design and drive adaptive solutions. So the locals are those that are facing the sea daily. They are those who know the environment. It's not me in Paris who can say better than them what are the marine issues that MSP process in this area should address. But at the same time, why top down? As we discussed in the plenary this morning, we have a legal framework. We have international agreements about MSP. We have the national policies about MSP. So in a way, even that sometimes these policies are developed also consulting the stakeholders, they are a top-down mechanism. And when we say when top-down meets bottom-up, we are trying to build this dialogue between the two levels, the top and the bottom. And more than this, we want the exchange knowledge and the information flow in both ways. And I think this is the challenge, how to build a mechanism that the information flow can uh, occur between these two levels. But how the MSP Global Initiative is integrating the local voices in the process. So first of all, I'd like to present the initiative for those who are not aware yet. So um, the European Commission and IOC UNESCO, they adopted the joint roadmap to accelerate MSP process worldwide. And the MSP Global Project was designed to achieve the priority actions of this joint roadmap. So here we have our boat with the work package of the project. And uh, one of the, our outcomes is to develop MSP guidelines on transboundary MSP. And we, are, uh, we also have two pilot cases. We have in the West Mediterranean a transboundary pilot case now integrating not only the EU countries who are already used through many projects, but also the non-European countries from the north of Africa. And we have a cross-border case in the Southeast Pacific between Ecuador and Peru. That is the one that I will present. And for us, the stakeholders are the core of the initiative. So this is the Gulf of Guayaquil. So here we are between Ecuador and Peru. And this is the area where we are developing our uh, pilot case. So what's the status of MSP in this region? Well, both countries, they have strategic plans for coastal and marine areas, but they don't have MSP plans. What does it mean? They have some objectives related to the marine environment, mainly management objectives, but they are not really talking about the use of the area and how to plan the use of the area. And uh, what's the, the cross-border uh, maritime, uh, main maritime activity of this area? The fishing grounds are the main shared resources. So here in this picture that we took in Peru, you can see two different artisanal fishing boats. This one is from Ecuador, and the other one is from Peru. And in both sides, we can see fishing boats from both countries. And it's actually it's a quite interesting area to work because when you are talking to the local actors, they say, ah, I have a family who live in the other country. So it's a very close relationship that they have. So this is good because it's not a challenge for us. And what are 
our objectives in this area, what the project wants to, to do in this area. So the idea is to contribute to the pre-planning phase in both countries uh, and to support the development of national recommendations. Um, because there is a binational commission between the both countries, but the marine issues are not at the core of the discussion, and we want to bring MSP to this. Well, who are the stakeholders? So through all the, pro uh, the project, we, we developed the stakeholder database, and we are filling the stakeholder database and how we started this project. Again, as an intergovernmental organization, the strategy was to contact the national focal points of each country, of each beneficiary country, and then they nominated a national focal point for the project and national experts on MSP. Most of the national experts, they are governmental institutions who work with some, um, uh, something related to MSP since they still don't have a, a proper MSP plan. And we are using, of course, the snowball strategy to talk with all stakeholders that we, we meet in this long way of the project and asking who is missing in the, in the meetings. We, and we, for the local aspect, the visits to the pilot areas are very important to map these stakeholders. So now I would like to present the start, a strategy for public participation of the project. So we are working with these four levels, with the local level, national, cross-border, and the global. And uh, when Andrea was uh, introducing the, the workshop, she talked about why. And this is something that for us, since the beginning, it needs to be very clear when we are talking to the stakeholders. What are the outcomes of the project? What we want to achieve? To manage their expectation about the project. And I would like to start the, the, to present the strategy with the outcomes that we expect. So at the global level, the guidelines that I mentioned, but focusing in our cross-border pilot case, these re-national recommendations that we would like to achieve, but to support the development of the binational recommendations, that is something that it will be done by the binational commission and not by us, we are developing technical reports about the current and the future conditions of the area. So it's a way to contribute to the discussion. And for this, we are uh, implementing many engagement activities, such as trainings, and uh, uh, we have national trainings, and we invite the local actors from the transboundary area to these trainings. And at the regional level, we will have the workshops with both countries. So just to explain very quickly how we are developing our trainings. So basically we have three pillars, a theoretical approach about what's MSP, what's blue economy, about data and information. And we have a module specific about stakeholder participation in marine splash planning. To, uh, it's a way to tell them how the stakeholders can be involved. It's a way to tell mainly to the governmental authorities why they should involve more the stakeholders. Then we have a practical exercise using the MSP challenge board game that many of you have already played and some played yesterday. And we ask these, uh, the participants to present the national perspective. So what's the MSP status, the, MSP, the status of the discussions about the topic, about coastal management as well. And we ask them as well to present, uh, we do a panel on blue economy to present the main maritime activities and discuss how they can be more sustainable. And at the end, we also ask the participants to provide recommendations for the national MSP process. So we collect all these recommendations and we forward to the national focal point of the project. So our objectives in the training course is to give a big picture of the whole process. It's not a technical course for some decision support tools like Markson or, the, or these things. No, we want to level in the playing field. This is our objective. Because if we want the stakeholders to discuss it at the regional level, we need the, that all of them are aware about all the steps of the MSP process. And we are trying as much as we can to stimulate the participation. So we have some pictures here. We have our colleague Americo from, from Peru. So this is uh, our activity that we do with the MSP uh, challenge. So we ask the participants to develop a vision for a fictitious plan. And in this exercise, as you can see, actores, actors, uh, we ask them to 
think about who could be the key actors to engage, to achieve the objectives they developed for each plan. These are all the recommendations, for example, that we collected from Ecuador. And one thing that we can already see, uh, many of the recommendations, they are talking about participation. So I think to have a module on stakeholder participation, in a way it's bringing for them the idea that this is really important. And uh, this is a planner from a local authority. And uh, it's what, uh, another thing that we also ask the participants is, okay, what is, what could be your role in the MSP process? And he, as a local planner, he said that he would increase the awareness about MSP among the local actors who are not participating in the training course. So what's linking this capacity building with the outcomes that we, we want to develop, the meetings with the stakeholders? both formal and informal meetings. And uh, for us, what's very important is, again, to create this information flow between all these levels. So we have informal local meetings, and when we talk with the national stakeholders, we try to bring what we heard, and then we talk, when we talk with the local authors, we try to bring some answers to them. So we are, our role is really as a bridge between these levels. And again, I have some pictures here from Ecuador and from Peru. So this too is from our first visit there in January when we talked very informally with the fishers. Here he was explaining us because there in, in Peru, they, uh, they have a zone specific for uh, artisanal fisheries until five nautical miles. And in Ecuador, it's until eight. So he was explaining us and drawing on, on the floor and here, uh, as I mentioned, we are developing this technical report. We are collecting data. So we invited uh, both local and national actors to review the data that we, we collected. So for us, it's very important during these discussions to uh, map what are the marine issues, the cross-border marine issues in the area. And where are we now? We are developing these reports to start next year the regional, the cross-border activities. And then, again, Andrea asked me as well, what, were the, what are the challenges and enablers in our case? And I did the other way around of Stephen, so I will start with the challenge. And for each challenge, I think we have a, an enabler to tackle this, to overcome this challenge. And uh, communication, the distance, of course, IOC is in Paris, and they are in South America. And uh, engage at the local level, it's very difficult. We, we call, we send email, but it's very difficult. And what's really helping us, it's since we, we are having like a strengthened network with the national authorities, they are also helping us to contact the, the local actors. In MSP, there will be always a question about representativeness of those who are, we are engaging how they really represent the, the interest of all involved. And this is why for us it's very important to keep uh, using the snowball strategy. Every time that we have a meeting, okay, who is not here and should be here in this discussion? And we are also mapping the stakeholders and this will be also be included in the technical report. So in the future, the, this the National Commission and even the MSP authority, they can have like a kind of list of key actors that they can engage. Manage expectations, it's a challenge, but we believe that when we are crystal clear about the objectives and the expected outcomes, it's a way to overcome and to manage this expectation. For example, remember the first time that we, we went to this local level, there was a, a local planner that they thought we would make a plan. And this is not, our, it's not IOC role. And uh, it, it needs to be very clear what are the outcomes of the project. But, it's a, we don't know how this top level, this national level, will really consider all these inputs from the bottom. So we are including, for us, it's, we think we need to include that in the technical report, how this will be addressed. This is beyond uh, our role in this process. But uh, we really think that talking a lot about stakeholder participation during the training courses with the governmental authorities is a way 
to um, support more participation. And the last challenge, it's a big challenge, not only in South America, I think it's a global challenge, a political crisis. Our national training course in Ecuador was one week before all that term oil that you saw on the news. We didn't know if we would be able to be there until the last minute, but we, we were there and the national training course was amazing. But I think there is something else uh, also related to this, all this political crisis. I think the citizens are calling for more participation. The citizens are calling for solutions and there are a lot of people who want to be part of the solution. So I think we need to take advantage of this moment and not focus only in the term oil, but on what people want. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, now I didn't press the button. I am on. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I was already thinking about the next step. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, please uh, stay question. here. Do we have a question Questions. for in the audience? Questions. I have a microphone here. Who yeah. wants the Who wants microphone? To a question to Michelle. Yes. Oh, you had a question last music. time, so it's good stuff. I have some online okay, questions. Thank you very much for this presentation. Actually, I already had for the previous presentation a question. I'm always a little bit worried about that, that we can inform and invite and then ignore the stakeholders. So my question is how to have the stakeholders' opinions and hopes on the real plan. But Michelle. So this is this is really a challenge for us because at the end we will not we are not the ones who will make the plan. So we are giving support for them to make the plan. And so we are trying to include not only data collector from the different governmental authorities, but also to include this part of what are the drivers for a cross border MSP in this area. And we are really considering the local perspective about what are the drivers for this area. And uh, again, if they will consider their inputs when they are doing the, the plan, we don't know. But uh, we, we hope so. <laughs> Any more questions, Michelle? This was a really should relevant we, big one. Should we take one from Screen IO? That would be an we idea. We have a question on Screen IO for Michelle. It says, how to assure bottom-up success in Latin America with low degree of trust in authorities? <laughs> yes, this is, this is a, a really big challenge. And I think this, the, at least the authorities that are dealing with MSP-related issues bring them together with some meetings with the stakeholders. But we, what we are trying to do is before to have more these informal meetings without the governmental authorities mm -hmm. to give them like an open floor to talk about the situation and then talk with the national actors to, to listen to their perspective about the, the, the issues that they addressed. And then to them, uh, after that, put them together to discuss, but I read with some focus about what they said and about what's the answer between the authority. So in a way, trying to put them together, but very focused in, in the marine issues addressed. Yeah, well, that sounds like a good plan. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> good luck, wish you for your initiative as well. Ours is concluded here in the Pan Baltic scope, but the planning continues yes. and our workshop continues as well. So what's next? Yes, now it's a panel. So Michelle, you can you just sit, stay sit, sit, and uh, Stefan, you come back. And uh, we have an extra member, which is Thomas Andersson. Please come, sorry. Uh, yeah, bring your colors, my goodness. <coughs> it's down here. It's like two hours. Yes. Where were happening? Yes. And now we go to our uh, right. So this uh, uh, this is has been going on during the time of the speech. Is uh, first. So I would like to remind you: you can continue to add your enablers and challenges online. Uh, and now we're walking into the the panel discussion session, and uh, we have a new member we haven't met before today. Hey, Thomas, we have met a lot before. <laughs> we have worked together. Could you please um, 
present yourself a little bit to the audience so they get to know who you are as well. Yeah, so, is it on? Yeah. Hello, Susanne, and hello, the audience. Um, my name is Thomas Andersen, and I'm working at the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management. And we have been the, or we are the competent authority for developing the Swedish uh, Marine Spatial Plan. Uh, I've been part of the planning team for quite a few years and also instrumental in setting up our process. And I'm also doing a bit of training in different contexts about water resource management and MSP. So that's short about me. Mm -hmm. Good. You can keep the microphone because it's for you. We have three. more here. Yeah, one over there. And uh, on the screen, you guys, you can see, you can also see that you can, uh, this is when the colors come in, the, the notes, uh, the cards you have in your hands, because we will ask you questions and uh, we want you to answer by showing a color. And um, then we might come and ask what you mean to please tell us a little more. And uh, we want the panel to do the same thing. Uh, I'm going to sneak and not do it. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, uh, should we have something before we start? Do you want to start? Are you ready with your cards? Because this is topic number one for the panel and our global panel in the audience. Topic number one is how to include local knowledge in MSP and for what purposes is it most val uh, valuable? And the question we ask you guys is this. Uh, I'm going to say that local knowledge is crucial for regional and national level planning. If you agree with me, then you say yes in green, raise your green card. If you say no, I don't think so, you raise your red card and well, yeah, sometimes depends. You have your yellow card. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, there goes. I see, a, I see green, <laughs> lots of green, and some yellow. Very interesting. Who wants to start? Some, somebody yellow. Some yellow. <laughs> go, go, some go. yellow person. Please tell me why you think this is. Rona, you're also a prof in <laughs> stakeholder involvement. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Hello everybody, my name is Rona Fairgrieve and for my sins I have been involved in both the development of the MSP Directive and implementing national and regional marine planning in Scotland. But I am now on the dark side and working <laughs> for a consultancy. However, you get the benefit of all of this knowledge for free at the dark moment because side. I'm working for the Dutch government this week. So, um, <laughs> local knowledge is crucial for regional and national level planning. I swithered about this and then eventually went to yellow because it is crucial for, yes, it is undoubtedly crucial for regional and national planning, but it needs to be set into the context of existing parameters and existing knowledge uh, lines before you get that far. You have to, I think uh, Nico mentioned earlier about the idea of the box and moving around within it. Mm. Your, um, the data that you have that underpins regional and na or national level marine planning first and then regional, as we did it in Scotland, or regions building up to comprehensive national planning as they're doing it elsewhere, um, it's vital and it's essential for engaging stakeholders to make them feel part and parcel of the process. But um, local knowledge is useful, but it may not be sacrosanct. There may be considerable problems with it. It might be that it's anecdotal and it can't be demonstrated when you try and replicate it elsewhere. So it is, it is extremely important. It helps in bringing stakeholders into the whole process and making them feel a valued part of it. Um, but it is that the caveat is, is the maybe element because it's not a simple and straightforward process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank and you, I Rona. wonder if uh, Thomas here, who also held the yellow card, feels something similar. Well, I, I could say I tend to agree with most of what Rona said. Um, <laughs> right. And I also think it, I mean, it depends what context you are in. In some place, you might not have any digital data, then that could be a way of gathering data. Uh, then it also depends on what kind of plan are you doing? What is your assignment? And uh, if it's a uh, Coming from a top-down perspective, it might not be that important to have all, all the local knowledge mm -hmm. involved. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So it right. depends. I mean, it's, it's not a straightforward answer, really. It's so it's um, maybe political so or system related and uh, also maybe time. Time and resources is one resources. thing to consider, but that, yeah. that's not really in the question here. But no, I mean, involving a lot of local stakeholders takes time for the planners, mm -hmm. but also for the people involved. So it depends then what, what you can expect from them and what you tell them to expect from you as a planner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We are running, we are showing this discussion a little bit in parallel because you can see there's actually some things that are showing up in the argumentation of, of uh, among the challenges and enablers. Yes. And we will pick on the up on that again. There were more yellow. Was there a global yellow somewhere? Global yellow. Outside of Europe, maybe. No. No. You're but there were more yellow wrong. cards in this sector, I think. Who had uh, the yellow card? Another yellow. Who else? I know Thomas there was yellow. I saw that. <laughs> that's the other that's Thomas, Thomas from SWAM. But you know, you had a yellow card, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, please. <laughs> so yellow. Let's see what was Okay, thank you. Alba uh, Nikodems, WhatsApp secretary. Uh, but uh, years ago, I worked for Latvian Ministry of uh, Regional Development and uh, Environmental Protection uh, Spatial Planning uh, Department. And I was involved in uh, producing this spatial uh, perspective for Latvia 2030. And uh, uh, in this question, you are asking local knowledge is crucial for regional and national level uh, uh, planning. I would agree that local knowledge is needed, but uh, maybe not crucial because there will be... Uh, Yes, uh, somehow now this planning has been developed in th that direction that public uh, uh, is more and more involved in, in planning, but still mm -hmm. I suppose that uh, experts and uh, specialists, uh, they have uh, something in their minds and they, they, I wouldn't say that they know better local circumstances, but uh, anyway, so that uh, these uh, local level should be uh, heard and should be uh, as much as possible uh, taken into account, but uh, indeed they are not crucial. They are, yeah, these views are needed and knowledge is needed, but uh, yeah, I agree with Rona and Thomas as yeah. well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So we have like two purposes. We have on the one hand, uh, it's actually input in, uh, in, in uh, data, and on the other hand, it's engaging. Are there any other purposes why it could be crucial to involve the local level in national planning? I, have, I think I have one min minute left. Yeah. One Who wants to say one something? One of you green guys. Do you have a reflection on what? Oh, well, uh, now I should pick someone else, Rona. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you chose yellow. Not just picking my friends. <laughs> Hi. I'm Arturo Rey, I'm a maritime cultural heritage expert. I've been working with UNESCO for a long time, although now I'm doing a research fellowship outside. Um, it's just a reflection on to maybe the talk that Michelle did before. Uh, in many of the continents outside Europe, for instance, I mean, this local reality is quite, quite different from the national plans, or to, and that creates quite a lot of conflicts. That's why maybe sometimes uh, indigenous communities, for instance, the way they see the, the sea escape, uh, and all the maritime landscape yeah. and the way they interact with that uh, is, is really very important to take into account in different planning exercises. Uh, I haven't seen, for instance, uh, what Michelle said between Ecuador and Peru, places where I've been working quite a lot, uh, how cultural heritage or regional beliefs have been taken into account or how data like underwater cultural heritage that is not there, it's completely invisible and probably society doesn't see it. So in a let's say uh, community-based approach, uh, they don't put it on the table because they don't know it, but it's there. And the government, for instance, they don't have the means to go and, and check it maybe because the inventories aren't there. How this is into the debate. No? So that's, it's just a reflection, it's not a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are other places like uh, Tikikaka Lake or Atitlan Lake in Guatemala in which really the involvement of indigenous communities is it's really different for the understanding of uh, the modern state that we have. So all these yeah. 
create some conflict of interest uh, that have to take into account and when implementing MSPs and other type of planning. So, no, it's just a reflection for right. thinking outside the box. Yes, Thank you. very good. Thank you Excellent. very much. And I think this is something that we really also need to think about because we are, side, we are in the box. We yes. are thinking planning. Yes, we and uh, now we're thinking uh, workshop planning. So now it's actually time for the and next yeah. step. Yeah. Just, just a comment yeah. about this yeah. reflection. I think this reflection is very important because we need to think about what's the cross-border issue. Because I understand the point of Rona and Thomas, but for example, in the case in between Ecuador and Peru, the cross-border issue, we are talking about fisheries and we are talking about artisanal fisheries. So if we, I don't go to this local level to talk with these artisanal fishers, I think I, I need to, because this is the stake in, the, in that context. I think I, I should not listen only the, the national government in this aspect. And I think in the cultural, you also have the, this aspect. They, are, they have different perspectives from the national, so it's important to, to listen both sides. Thank you, Michelle. That's, you keep the mic. Uh, because uh, I think it's very good to have, it's, it's not a traditional panel we're doing here, it's an interactive <laughs> panel, and as you can see, we're very interactive, and I'm running in, out into the audience. So, uh, <laughs> it's a non-traditional way also in, in moderating, I think. <laughs> right, but um, that was topic one. So now we're going to jump quickly into in topic two, to actually, and uh, you'll get plenty of opportunity to talk yet, all of you. Here is topic number two. How to deal with participants, this was lifted by our colleague over there earlier. How to deal with participants' expectations and balance informal conclusion with transparency. When they've given us their opinion, what do they expect us to do with it? Um, and the question for our traffic light or request statement is, Expectations from participants to influence MSP are problematic. Yes, no, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, um, yeah, it's a, uh, hmm. Lots okay. of yellow. Let's explore Lots the red one and the green, green ones. ones, I think. I see a red <laughs> one. Holy bandoli. I see two red, oh, there's three red ones. <laughs> this is interesting. We're a little bit really um, split on this question. That's no more good. votes. So, um, shall we go for a red one over there? Yeah, let's go for a red one. Okay, now let's see. Could you please present yourself and Not tell what, why you think this is problematic? Hello, uh, my name is Arno Pitsman from uh, Tallinn University, Estonia. And I have been also meeting local fishermen, um, not to do MSP, but for um, integrated coastal zone management plan. And uh, for them, uh, the national scale of MSP is just too large. Maybe I'm a geographer in my background, but having uh, expectations uh, for them, planning also means maybe financial means to improve something and planning doesn't give out any finances this is one of big issues mm -hmm. and also to understand that to influence uh, european fisheries policy for example yeah. is rather small in coffee table meetings does anybody from the panel want to react to this statement was there a green one on the panel i wonder Thomas was green. You think expectations from participants, that's you again, by the way, to influence MSP is pl problematic. Is our problem, yes. Yeah, well, it, it can be at least. It depends what, <laughs> what expectations we as planners have raised, really. So, so if, <coughs> if we are not very clear from the beginning of what we want and what we expect, and, mm. and if we are not able to, to express that and get that understood, then, then the expectations will be a problem because then people will be very unhappy with the result and you will lose your trust mm. which are perhaps the most important tool you have is the yeah. trust when you're building your your process and developing a plan so so yes it could be problematic but it partly depending on your yourself and how you present and, and handle the issue from the beginning basically you were yellow <laughs> but that's fine. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, Stefan, 
what would you say to, to what was just said? Well, I do see them and I don't see them as problematic because the local level stakeholders or the local actors, they have expectations, of course, of authorities. They have expectations from councils, etc. But just going to them and meeting up with them and actively talking of what are my expectations to them and asking them what are their expectations towards me is already solving this so-called problematization. Uh, it's mainly a problem with communication if we see it as uh, a problem. I mean, expectations, everyone has expectations for everyone. And it's always an issue when someone fails to meet your expectations. But it, if you just communicate of what the MSP can do and what it can't do, as Thomas said, it may already resolve the problematics. But you can also inform them that if you don't, if you're not included in this process, this can happen in the worst case scenario. So maybe scaring them a bit, but also informing them of the worst case scenario for them can re make them realize that, okay, my expectations aren't really real in this case, but my future uses of the sea can be affected. So there is a, it's complicated, but I don't see it as yes or no. Right. Right. There is someone who would like to respond yes. here in the Somebody audience. in the global panel. Do you want to share an experience? Yes, we have time. Yes, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. It's what we're here for. Sorry, hi, I'm Anna Segvarimas from Reunion Island, which is a French island in the Indian Ocean. Yeah. And we are doing MSP uh, for uh, like two years now, and we have really <laughs> a huge deal with the participant, uh, participant, uh, part making participating uh, the uh, stakeholders, local stakeholders. And actually, our experience is that I, I, I pay, I put a yellow card because sometimes it can be and sometimes it can't be. But actually, I should have put a green card. <laughs> So for some, in some extent, because we've got some some kind of stakeholders who say, why uh, do you consider more uh, one group of stakeholders and what do they say on MSP uh, than the other one? So we did a kind of stakeholder ranking uh, in in our project and uh, with four perimeters, uh, including the importance, the pertinence, and the uh, the influence on. Uh, mm -hmm and the willing of participating in the MSP process. And then sometimes people, they are just not, don't agree with that. They say, why, do, why the other is, uh, more, has more priority issues than we do have here. And uh, mostly when it comes to, like, for example, coastal tourism and uh, uh, fishermen and shark risk management, that it can be really, really, really problematic. <laughs> yeah. OK. Um, uh, just, just a comment, yeah. too. Um, I think it's, again, very much about the context. I mean, the, there's a difference between your fishermen in, in Ecuador and Bolivia there. Peru, sorry. Bolivia don't have a water. Ecuador and, and uh, Peru, and, and uh, the way we're doing it in Sweden, and, and what kind of, hmm. perhaps you should say, awareness or capacity people have to, to be part of the discussions. So again, you have to you have to look at this in your own context, in a way. Context matters. I, w <laughs> yeah. I would like to give the floor to a Peruvian <laughs> stakeholder. All right. Yes, he was on a okay, picture. Okay. Yes, here we have. He was in a picture, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was in the. <laughs> I've seen you before. <laughs> yeah, it's like I know you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, hello, <laughs> my name is Americo. I'm, yeah. I'm from Peru. Come from Peru, and I agree with. Uh, Uh, Michelle and and, ah, the, and the experts, yeah. Yeah. because the the, const, the the context means everything, because uh, sometimes the fishermen don't have a, a, a state to to share all his problems. So if if they don't have the context to 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 involve in the MSP process, um, mm. they they always share all the problems, and we mm. can solve all of them. <laughs> we have objectives from the it's for true. MSP. So we have to to inform them, to uh, to take more no knowledge about what what are we going to do with the with the with the with the process, yeah. and also take information that they need to uh, to can solve or to can take uh, uh, the the context of uh, 
of the problem that we are aborting to. So they have a lot of problems, like a social, political, economical, but uh, sometimes we have to, to say that, yes, we know that yeah. you have a lot of problems, <laughs> but uh, uh, we are aborting this one this time, mm. so we need your help, you, yeah. you need to involucrate in, the, in mm. all the process, and also I if you want uh, information, you have that kind of information, mm. and uh, sometimes they don't know that they, uh, uh, they also make uh, a lot of, of, of no, uh, of, of the of the context of the of, of the uh, of the activity or, or also of the context of the of the of the zone. No? For mm -hmm. example, um, Tumbes are in the north of Peru, and it's, uh, it's very different than the center of Peru in the coast. Uh, they, they have another uh, another type of activities. Uh, also, they they have the the, the mangroves, and uh, the other side of Peru doesn't yeah. have it. So they, right. they are different in, in many in many in many phases. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So you when you're facilitating, you also have to be aware of context. <laughs> are you grab your? <laughs> Absolutely. No very, very good point. Thank you very much. The, this is really. I, I, it's. I mean, when you when you start a workshop like this, you never know what is going to happen. So now Stefan wants the mic. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I would like Which to fine. respond to the reunion. Um, I see your issue of like raising stakeholders and asking them questions because they can give you information of anything. But you raise him, her, her, yes. raise her what? Uh, we ask also our stakeholders of like, what are the problems? And sometimes they're telling us that, okay, the eagles are causing a problem for our seabird population here. But we have to inform them, okay, thank you for telling us this conflict right now, but we can't really affect it with MSP. But just listening to them of sharing their knowledge I think it's the responsibility of the MSB authorities to sift out the information that we can then affect and tell them again that, okay, we can't affect this, but we can affect this. We will raise your problems, of course, to the other res representative authorities. But I don't think it's our task to rank or choose which stakeholders have uh, uh, information in one point, because in the beginning, our stakeholders, they weren't very they weren't aware what the MSP means, and they didn't think that they had information that would be valid for the MSP. But they were very motivated in the beginning. So we started talking with them, so do you have this kind of data? And they're like, yes. Well, why didn't you raise it in the beginning? Uh, why didn't you tell us in the beginning? So that kind of bar chart that told us in the beginning that, well, they don't have any data to share with us is going to increase from a two to maybe to five. It's, it's just a communication process and asking them constantly, hey, do you have anything? Yeah. Yeah. Ask them again, ask yeah. them again, that's your citation. Yes, ask Lowry. them once, ask them again, and then <laughs> ask them again, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, Next. so um, now we have a little uh, extra uh, before we go to topic number three, because uh, the screen I.O. is now turning into a voting session. You can now go back into the screen I.O. and you can choose your favorite enablers and challenges, three of each. I hope you pick three of each. And then we get, uh, in the end, we will talk about this in the final session. And we are going to bake this together to uh, our conclusions from the workshop. Yes. So you, you can participate in our you recommendations. You are definitely part of our conclusions. So um, you see that at the same time as we go on to the third topic. We'll make that a little bit quicker because the third topic is a bit different. We sort of started it already how to work around limitations in mandates and resources is something that's been coming up. And the question, now we get lots of things to do at the same time, it's green IO and it's now back to the cards of color. Because we want to ask you here, here. Now, there are good examples of how to work around limitations in mandate and resources in MSP. Do you agree? Yes. Do you not agree or do you say, well, maybe we want a lot of greens here. This is a hint. <laughs> <laughs> Please give us lots of greens. Good examples Who of how to work neighbors? around limitations and mandate in res and resources in MSP. How do you if have you don't examples? have enough money, what do you do? If you don't have uh, a mandate, what do you do? Examples of what you did to move further, move along. But otherwise, vote red. 
<laughs> yes, if that's Please? the truth, that's the truth. <laughs> if you don't yeah. know anything, vote red. Yes. If you maybe know something, vote yellow. Stefan so was please, bravely right. enough to show the yellow. <laughs> so, anybody else feel brave? Yes, Thomas is brave. Might be some ways out. You say red, out. you don't find one, not yet. All right, but you know, we're working on it, right? The community. There's a green the one. The community. There's but a green oh, one, Rona. <laughs> there are good examples up there. Good one. We'll get, are you going to run in the audience, Andrea? I'm going to run. I was Go just to expecting some maybe. more running, so I, I start this way. <laughs> so, Rona, please. <laughs> Sorry, I'll be quick this time. Um, there are good examples of how to work around the limitations because the benefit of the, the marine planning process we have at the moment is that some started early. And there are great examples right the way across the world, as we've been hearing today. Um, it's not a case of everybody operating at exactly the same time or exactly the same um, speed. So the limitations in mandate and resources, two different things. Limitations in mandate, well, if you are the national authority, you set the mandate according to what you want to get out of the overall situation. And certainly from Scotland, we overhauled our legislation and all of our frameworks in order to make them fit for purpose to deliver marine planning. And I have to say we did that in advance of the directive um, because we were already working towards it for the benefits of Scotland PLC. We wanted space to fit offshore wind farms into our areas in combination with the other activities that were already taking place. And the best way of doing it was to see what we already had to realise that over 40 years the policy context had changed and therefore our legislative framework had to change with it. So that I would suggest to you is a good example of how to, how to take a limited mandate and actually expand it and make it better. The resources for MSP, hmm. <laughs> as we are also discovering, um, you, you set off with these expectations and the promise of limitless money and then of <laughs> course the money squelches. <laughs> However, there are good examples of being able to work uh, proactively and from a non-statutory perspective. It doesn't always have to be statutory, even within a system that delivers a statutory marine plan. And you can get great examples of working with people um, if you already have, for example, mechanisms and local frameworks already set up. And certainly in Scotland, we were very lucky to have a network of ICZM partnerships that had been established 20 plus years ago, which were uh, revitalized and recycled. See, good example of circular economy um, into marine planning. And we have used those in order to experience, uh, in order to get a huge amount of good value for money work done to contribute towards marine planning. So yes, it's, I think there are good examples of both. But having said that, and one of the other challenges, I have said that resources for MSP is one of the major challenges for ensuring that as we go ahead, all the good work that has been established is not ultimately lost. Very good. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Rona. Very good. Anybody well, from the panel would like to respond to this? Yes, I think we had a card up there. It was Stefan. yellow. <laughs> and it was um, Stefan. Yes, I can respond to why I raised yellow. Uh, I would say that there are examples. I wouldn't say that they're good or bad. That's the problem. The definition of good examples is hard to say because examples have to be adapted to each MSP process separately, to each legislation separately, because one example or one good example might work for Peru and Ecuador, but it won't work, for example, for the local fishers in Holland unless we adapt it to meet their needs and their limitations and the MSP resources that we have. Because it's always about the resources in the end. We have money that requires uh, paying my salary, for example, meeting the stakeholders in the evening, is always an expense that is outside of the budget and we have to find that budget somewhere. But yes, there are examples. There are definitely good and bad examples, but in the end, they're all examples that have to be adapted. Well, I have an um, example of, um, you know, limitation, uh, 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 enabler to solve the limitation of the resource for MSP, and this is one of them. I mean, uh, the Pan Baltic Scope project, the, the possibility to have that project meant that more countries around the Baltic could spend more time uh, 
on MSP than they could have otherwise. So, thank you. But not all of <laughs> countries have a project that EU can support. No, but I'm saying it's an example. Yeah. So, example. Okay. It, you can uh, imitate <laughs> this in, in other areas of the world as well. <laughs> Try it's to pool your resources to get cross-border planning and participation. Exactly. Going. Yes. There's there's a microphone. Mike is coming. Move it. It's moving, moving. Here moving, moving, and then we have to sit. Here it comes. I think the, the, the key word here is adaptation. Because yes. uh, if you have a lot of examples, they, they are doing in a context yeah. of, the, of, the, of yeah. the country or the region or the area that yeah. you are planning. So I, if we adapt these examples to our uh, reality, we can do something better mm. and maybe uh, take a, a new, a new um, uh, take, take, a, take that, that examples to, to do or to involve the, the stakeholders right. and solve the, the problems and get a very, uh, a very realistic objectives in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in our special planning. So yeah. Yes, and it's a learning process along the way. Yeah. Ask them, ask them again, then ask them again. Uh, because they learn report. during the way and the, the answers will change. So, we're Next on our way step. to finalizing this, uh, this day because we're on the... This is you. Is this me? Oh, First yeah. Part. It's about the challenges and the enablers that have now been running. Yeah. We Let, would like let's to see, see the voting. Yeah, let's see the voting. Mikael. That's been where it's our and the, the challenge and enablers pros. And we here here we see what is on the screen. Is it uh, possible to read for everyone or you can follow it on the I can read it on if your you want devices? to. Okay, so, um, so leading, coming in on the finishing straight. Do you want me to? Yeah. Uh, for enablers, uh, the leader is um, yeah pretty significant right now. Time, effort, patience, and trust to collect local level stakeholder knowledge. The second one is transparency about project of objectivities and expected outcomes. It seems very good things always. Um, understanding each other's needs, obstacles, methods, and processes. Was there a, this a common pattern all, all the time? Or give him the microphone, please. Ah, I see. <laughs> Soaring very low. I'm standing behind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was, I was following this closely while this uh, was building up. But we have to say there was a little of a technical issue, as you can see, ah. because there's a. Actually, this would mean that I think the transparency is really on top now because oh. we have transparency twice. There was a oh, there little uh, technical issue, so we have like well. uh, more than 20. Then I can read one, one more. Yes, you can yes. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm going to read uh, the third then, <laughs> which is, uh, okay, it's changed. And something moved up because learning from others' methods, mistakes, challenges, and experiences. This is also very good. Uh, and as you see, can see, then it's a very close running mini eights. So, but very clearly, who won then if it's both 13 and 8? And for me, following closely the word cloud, I mean, this is yeah. uh, not a big surprise, but no. I think I'm taking a little bit ahead. But I mean, you want to reveal the word cloud first? Uh, we, I, I think we first take, uh, take a look at the, at the challenges, the challenges. as yeah. well, because this is where probably where we need to prioritize. So what should we prioritize when working with stakeholders? Is Let's there look a at the main challenges. No. Uh, this is uh, difficult to move. Motivate, sorry, why st stakeholders should attend new MSP collaboration networks. This new thing, why should we get into that? Why is this better than the last thing? Time, effort, patience and trust. Yeah, same thing. It's some things are both challenges and enablers, aren't they? Um, to collect local level stakeholder knowledge. And then we have to give voices for different concerns and to achieve multiplicity in discussions. Wow, 
And I think that was also a very nice perspective when you lifted like the, the low, uh, that uh, different cultures have different views on the sea and that kind of, that we, uh, from a planner or researcher or expert perspective also go out to start thinking differently and learn from that. But it's a challenge. Yeah. It could be an enabler too. Yeah, many things, you know, depends on which side you look at it. It's a challenge or and an enabler. John has a... Could we John, get a I need a microphone, John? Michelle. Can I steal it from you? <laughs> Don't kill yourself jumping over hurdles. No problem. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I need my exercise. I haven't been exercising yeah. for you. Can exercise? Just yeah. don't die. Um, <laughs> yes. There's, there's been like a lot of talk about uh, trust and expectations, but the most important word absolutely no one's mentioned is influence. So the point is, if you can show stakeholders that their contributions are making an in influence, you're going to build trust and you're going to meet expectations. And I think this is where national planners need to get much more political and much more strategic, borderline Machiavellian in their use of stakeholder engagement, actually. Because stakeholder engagement, it's not just about uh, you know, getting ideas, but it's also a source of pressure. It's also a source of critical mass. For example, if Thomas, if you come to me and I'm a politician with another generic recommendation from an EU project, Project. I want to be like, yeah, it's nice to see you, Thomas. Thanks for your time. But if you come to me with a recommendation and you've got five sectors behind it, you've got 200 businesses and you've got five angry pensioners, I'm going to listen. <laughs> so, and so I think you need to, national planners need to be more strategic, more political in their use of stakeholder engagement as a, as a two-way process. More practical. Yeah. Concrete. Practical. Yeah. They get into the workshop, not just uh, sp talking. All right. We have a response. Uh, yeah. well, not a response. I mean, you're right. And it's also we're lumping together all kind of different stakeholders under the, the word stakeholders. I mean, there's a huge difference between global, um, global petroleum company, perhaps, or offshore wind industry and local fishermen. And well, we're talking about bottom up approach here. But, but you're right. I mean, in the end, depend, it depends on what kind of plan you're doing and what is the assignment. And what is the political interest in, in what you're supposed to achieve? So, so yes, perhaps we need to separate the stakeholders a bit more in, in groups also now when we are discuss, discussing. So you mean the stakeholders that they get together and can get a clear point that it is easier for them to put forward? I mean, uh, it depends. I mean, if you, if you get an assignment as a planner that you should develop a national plan or a, quite a huge plan for a huge uh, water area, then, then it comes from the government level. And it's probably a, a national priorities behind the, the task you have got as a planner. And that would count in the end. So wh what is the national priorities for, for uh, fishery or, or mining or whatever it could be? Um, that is what planning is about also. We have a tendency to forget that, I think, when we talk about stakeholder engagement. Good. You can keep it for the while anyway. Uh, because um, now we have to move to, oh, do, do you have, do you want to, yeah, you can say something clearly yeah. if you want yeah, to. I think you, <laughs> yeah, Sorry. That's, that's one thing I wanted to ask. You have been very silent, so yeah. please. Uh, yes, uh, no, the, the point here about the influence, I think we also need to be careful to not give more power to already powerful stakeholders in the process. I think it's also something that we need to manage the, this influence in, in the process. Uh, of course, it depends on, on, the, on each case, but it's something that we need to be careful to not make MSP uh, a tool to just reinforce the status quo. Right, good. So, I'm going to move us into the word cloud that is uh, being, uh, has been uh, worked on all day, all through our workshop now. And uh, you can see what's happening. I think you showed us the leaders right now. It's uh, uh, listening in the middle. Political will, yeah. capacity building. More capacity on local level. I can't see that, but OK. Uh, maybe it's just long. Have there been any changes um, over time, you think? Yeah. Can make us say yes. I follow this with great interest. And actually, capacity bill and knowledge development was the first uh, choice to go double digit. So Ooh. we had this one. And then, but then also <laughs> closely followed by listening to stakeholders, communication, and discussion as were very high, too. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I think important also as one of the global panelists here said, like, uh, like avoid something like first inform, invite, and later ignore. So this is more or less kind of what, what combines the, the, the yeah. results here, I think. And interesting also was that this more like a legalistic perspective, like a, the, do binding plans or regulation did not receive as many votes. So ah. that was kind of a, some of the interesting takeaways. It's interesting now the number one and two is like the same thing almost. Listening, Listening. and communication is part of the same Kind of thing. Ask, ask again, and then ask again. So okay. A planner should not just plan, but communicate, and they enable stakeholders to communicate. Yes. So this might be our final word. And there we need a lot of end. capacity building for doing that, especially on local level. Yeah. I think <laughs> now I got the most, <laughs> the gist of it. Brilliant. Well, our time. Yes. Is, uh, our time well, is 30. almost up. I would li just like uh, a few final words. And, and uh, I think it has been a very, very interesting discussion. And uh, for uh, Suzanne and me, yeah. it has also been an experiment. Absolutely. Uh, experimenting with several threads of communication at the same time. <laughs> and uh, trying to, so to say, be participatory at the same time as we work with content and keep a time schedule, which is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. It's 12.31. <laughs> And I would like to, on one hand, also mention all the Nordregio stuff and the FIAX SE people who have been taking notes and running around and helping oh, yes. me. It was not just me running and uh, distributing cards. And we hope, of course, that you have liked it. And I want to thank our dear panelists who have been here and presenters who have provided a lot of really interesting hands-on information. And you have come Very and good. contributed thank your you. own. So this is really, I think we should give ourselves a real big applaud. And then, and Marie, thank you. And Marie, thank you. There you go. Taking, turning MSP bottom up. Thank you very much. And that's Great. it. We're done. Oh, yes, I forgot <laughs> to mention our screen I.O. <laughs> oh, yes, She's thank there. you. Very good. And Marie, who's taking notes and will help us reporting uh, in, the, in the final session. So stay tuned. Uh, the, and this, what you see on the screen is now also going to be saved, I think. Yeah. And I would like to say thank you on behalf of the organizers to the uh, faces on the, <laughs> yes. on yes. the stage. Oh, thank, thank you, you very you. much, Leon. Thank All right. You. Thank you very much. Wow. This is going to be a, a good session tonight. <laughs> My goodness, we got <laughs> we got snacks. Get to, to <laughs> yeah. the or on the ferry back. Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to take the ferry home yeah. with us? Thank, Thank you very much. Thank oh, you. And enjoy your lunch. So now lunch time. <laughs>